Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship yeah. on Easter Day. And we start our worship this morning with the traditional acclamation of Easter. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. 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 So let us pray together. Living Lord, on this Easter day, we come to bring you our praise and worship. We come to declare that you have risen. We come to declare that because of your life, we live. And we live to worship and praise you. You are the source of our hope. You are the source of our joy. You are the source of our love. And so it is with great love, joy and hope that we worship you this morning. You are the Lord of all life and power. And through your mighty resurrection, you have overcome the old order of sin and death to make all things new. So we pray that you would help us, that we might be dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ. 
and we give you all the glory, honour, praise and power this morning through him who lives and reigns. Amen. And Sonia is going to bring us our opening reading. Reading Acts 10, 34 to 43. Um, then Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. By us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Sonia. And I, I noticed you weren't thrown by the fact that I put the wrong half of the reading up on the screen there to begin with. That's why there was a pause. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed it. So thank you, Sonia. Well, as well as being Easter Day today, I think we should mention that under normal circumstances, today would be Beeston's church anniversary. And for the second year running, we've not been able to meet for Beeston's church anniversary. So we're particularly glad. Well, I know we have Sonia and Mary and Cynthia here today representing the folks from Beeston and others who will be joining using the worship at home. So we have particular prayers for the people of Beeston this morning and for the work of Beeston Methodist Church. You may also have noticed that down in the corner of the screen there, there is a dressed cross, which far superior to my clip art version. Thanks to David and Jane. That is Sandy's dressed cross. I, I rather like Sonia got an email saying, would you do a reading at about nine o'clock? David and Jane got an email going, you haven't by any chance, have you? And they had. So that picture there is the cross that is outside the chapel at Sandy this morning as we celebrate this Easter day. And our next hymn is continuing with the theme and we sing or listen to the hymn, Christ has risen while earth slumbers. Christ has risen while their slumbers, Christ has risen where of night. As he said and as he promised, as we doubted and denied, let the Lord embrace the blessing, let the sons Christ has risen, God is here. Christ has risen. 
Our gospel reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. And this is probably the earliest of the gospel accounts of Jesus rising from the dead. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Let's pray. Loving God, you come to us in many different ways. You come to us through the words of scripture. You come to us through songs through prayer, and when we can, through bread and wine. And you come to us through the gathered company of your people. We pray that you would come to us now as we consider the words of Scripture, that they might be for us the word of God to our heart. Through Jesus' name. Amen. I've been considering and contemplating these resurrection accounts and really been thinking, how do we tell the story of Jesus risen from the dead at this particular time, at this particular moment? I'm trying to do it in a way which isn't going over the old ground of the past year or isn't self-indulgent, but that sense of what might we find from the stories of Jesus' resurrection that can help us as we prepare to continue down the roadmap out of lockdown. I think perhaps it's because I'm mindful that after the year that we've had, the next steps may require for many of us a huge amount of physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological effort. A year ago, when we thought that it was going to be just a short period, you remember three weeks to three weeks to crush the sombrero or something, wasn't it? We we probably thought returning to normal wouldn't be any effort at all. But a year on, I wonder how we feel. And it strikes me that one of the things about the Easter season, if we're not careful, is that the Easter season is a 40 day period a 40 day period which ends with the ascension and in recording the ascension the luke the gospel writer says that after 40 days the disciples had had sufficient proof 
So to a certain extent, it strikes me that coming to terms with understanding and being ready for the life that came afterwards took the disciples a lot longer than coming to terms with what had happened on Good Friday. And our reading today is remarkable in that the women were coming to do the job of anointing Jesus' body. I'm not saying that they had come to terms with Jesus dying. It is perhaps worth us bearing in mind that they lived in a culture and a time where death was upfront and close in a way that perhaps it isn't in our culture. But there's a sense to which once Sabbath was over, probably in the evening, if we read carefully, Mary, the Marys and Salome and the other women, they went off to buy the spices. They set about the practical task of anointing Jesus and of coming to terms with what had happened. And it strikes me that in the first verses of this passage, when Mark is describing them preparing and then coming to the tomb, he doesn't describe their feelings. They are just getting on with what they have to get on with. They are facing full in the face the fact that Jesus has gone. Jesus, they've seen him die and he's gone. And Mark doesn't waste any time on the feelings. They, they have a question. The question they have is who's going to roll the stone away. But in a sense, those first few verses are all very practical. And it strikes me that perhaps there's a truth in that, that facing the reality of difficulties and death can sometimes be a lot easier than imagining what might come afterwards. That process of life taking on a new form, taking on a new shape, that process of having to come out after the disastrous or sorrowful thing has happened isn't always as easy as living in the moment when it has. We know that from the way that some people respond when a loved one has died and they get very caught in the practicalities. Often you'll have conversations in those first few hours or days that are all about the things that need to be done. And that can sometimes feel easier than the thought of what next. And I wonder, as we come to emerge from lockdown, whether we sort of understand that, that sense of the last year, we've come to terms with that. The what next is a bit more difficult. And Mark perhaps helps us in this shorter ending to his gospel, because what he gives us is something that is incredibly human. It's, it's not airy-fairy. Mark doesn't have angels. He describes the visit to the, to the tomb as a young man. He describes women who are getting about the business that they need to get about with. And it all seems to be very rooted in human experience. And I find that really helpful. So we have women who are obviously grieved, deeply grieved because of what's happened to Jesus. His death was particularly brutal and they come to tend his body and they've got the natural question of who's going to roll the stone away. They're probably glad that the stone was there because it means that Jesus will have been undisturbed as they had to observe the Sabbath. And they come and then they look up and they see the stone has already been rolled away. And then things begin to change. And it's as they begin to change that Mark begins to introduce some feelings and some responses from the women. They saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. It's an interesting word, that word for alarm, because it can mean a positive as well as a negative response. At first, it may be they were astonished. They were thinking, wait a minute, just a minute ago, we were wondering how we would move the stone. And you're sitting here and you seem to have done it on your own. You know, that sense of, oh, my goodness, who are you? 
which gives way to a different kind of, wait a minute, who are you? We don't recognise who you are. And as they take in the scene and realise that the tomb is empty of all but him, then perhaps the alarm moves to that different kind of alarm of who are you and what has happened here and where is Jesus's body? That process they're going through of taking in what's going on and of realising things are not quite what they were expecting. Is that where we are right at the moment? Taking in the fact that horrific things have taken place and yet things aren't quite what we expected. Do we have that sense of alarm? Whichever way we look at it, is it the sense of alarm that things are moving too quickly and we're not ready yet to emerge or a sense of alarm that says, wow, this is amazing. We didn't expect to be here just yet. That's all caught up in the word that is used to describe the women's reaction of alarm. And obviously it showed on their faces because this young man in the tomb said, don't be alarmed. He obviously could see it, couldn't he? And then he delivers this message, which is mysterious and maybe that they didn't even fully understand. Remember, these are part of Jesus' disciples who hadn't really understood what he said when he had said to them, I will die, but on the third day I will rise again. And he says to them, you are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. He was crucified. There's no denying that Jesus was crucified. He did die. But he has risen. He's not here. Come and see the place where they laid him and then go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. Well, if you've ever been in a position of trauma and alarm, then you may understand that they didn't necessarily take in all of his words. And Mark goes on to describe that they were trembling and bewildered. Trembling is quite simply what it says, that they started to shake. I almost imagine that the, there was a point at which this was so overwhelming that they began to tremble and shake. And possibly the reason when they realised it happens, when they heard the spices fall on the floor, those sorts of things that happen when we are confronted with something that is totally unexpected. We might imagine them having to help each other to a place where they could sit down. Such was the unexpected nature of what was going on. Who knows whether at first they fully understood what he said. They may have needed to question him if he was still there. They may have had to take it all in. Is that how we're feeling right now? That sense of needing to take everything in, that sense of needing to come to terms with all that has gone on. Mark says they're trembling and they were bewildered. That word bewildered literally means that sense of everything was out of place. The Greek word is ecstasis, which we get the word ecstasy from. It literally means everything has gone to a different place. That sense of it all looks the same and yet somehow it's all different. Somehow my mind and my body and my emotions need to take in what's going on and need to put it all together. You know, that sense of being out of kilter, that sense of being out of step. That sense of I need a moment to process what's happening here. That's the sense that they had, that sense of bewilderment. That perhaps they needed just to locate themselves for a moment to realise again where they were, to realise again what was happening. Perhaps you've had that experience where something so unexpected happens that you forget what you were originally doing. I've used the example of a car crash, that moment when from nowhere and all of a sudden what's normally happening gets disrupted by a sudden impact and you need a moment to take it in. 
trembling and bewildered, Mark says, the women went out and fled from the tomb and said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's an interesting insight, isn't it? That they had to come to terms with the fact that nothing was quite as it seemed. It might be a good reminder to us that sometimes life is not what we were expecting. Sometimes things are not quite how they seem. That sometimes we can't fit things into nice stories. As humans, we love to create stories from things. We love to link one thing to the next. But the truth is sometimes things aren't linked. Sometimes things aren't neat and tidy. Sometimes it doesn't go in a glorious flow in the way that we would want to. Sometimes we have to come to terms with the fact that we're not fully in control. And perhaps that moves us back to that idea of mystery. The word afraid is an interesting word in Mark's gospel because he tends to use it for the moments when people get an insight to the fact that God is doing something in the midst of all of this. One place in particular where we see it is when Jesus calms the storm. The disciples are in the boat. The storm is raging. They wake Jesus up and he speaks to the storm and he calms the storm. And then Mark says they were afraid. The storm they had seen before. They knew how these things worked. Jesus being able to command the winds and the wave they had never seen. And that's what made them afraid. Perhaps it's the same here for these women. They've seen death before. They've come and they've dealt with these things before. But it's the empty tomb that makes them afraid because it's the empty tomb that suggests that God is doing something unexpected, something out of the ordinary, something different. And maybe, maybe, that's what Easter says to us, that some of the things that we've come to slowly adjust to, we can cope with, we can face those things. But it's the next thing that leaves us feeling slightly nervous. You see, if this is the end of Mark's gospel, and in some texts it is, you'll notice that they didn't actually see Jesus. They left the tomb afraid and it says they said nothing to anybody. It's they said nothing to anyone. I think Mark gives us a hint that that isn't the end of the story. He seems to be saying there is something else to come and I'm going to hint at it, but I'm not going to tell you. I've told you enough already about this man, Jesus. I've told you enough already about how this man, Jesus, was present in the world in which these people lived. He was present with them as they faced the various challenges that this world throws up. Sickness, natural disaster, even those supernatural things which the gospel writers describe as demonic. I've told you that in all of that. The presence of Jesus is good news. And now I leave you with a picture of an empty tomb and women who are not quite certain, who are alarmed because things weren't quite as they expected, who are trembling because something different is happening, who are bewildered because everything is out of place. But I leave you with the sense that God is in it. That God is present. And as the women leave the tomb, perhaps what Mark is saying to us is that we too have to leave the tomb. Because if we don't, it becomes our own tomb. We too somehow can emerge from a scene of death and destruction into the hint that something new is beginning. 
He doesn't suggest it's easy. He doesn't suggest that it can be readily explained. But he suggests that because the tomb is empty and because the promise is made that Jesus will meet us when we go, that there is a compelling reason for us to somehow take hold of ourselves with all of our fear, with all of our trembling, with all of our bewilderment and step out of that place of death into a place of life and perhaps that's it perhaps that's it on easter day that in the end what the empty tomb is saying is i'm not inviting you to come in but i'm compelling you to go out i'm compelling you to go out and to look for the evidence that christ is alive to go out and expect that Christ will meet you on the way, just as he has said he would, to go out and to live as those who truly believe that Christ is risen. And he is risen indeed. Alleluia. We come again to song as we come to our next song, which is this joyful Easter tide. come together to pray. Um.
on this day that the Lord has made, let us pray for the people he has redeemed. That we may live as those who believe in the triumph of the cross. That all may receive the For those born to new life in the waters of baptism may know the power of his resurrection. That those who suffer pain and anguish may find healing and peace in the wounds of Christ. That in the undying love of Christ, we may be united with all who have died in the faith of Christ. Let us commend the world in which Christ rose from the dead to the protection of God. Amen. And let us continue in prayer as we bring our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, to whom it is right that we bring our thanks and praise. Blessing and honour. Glory and power are rightly yours, O gracious God. By your creative word, you brought the world to birth. In your generous love, you made the human family, that we might see your glory and live forever in your presence. When we wandered from you in our sin, you sought us that with your steadfast love and did not give us up. In the fullness of time, you sent your son to be our saviour and deliverer. Made of flesh and blood, he lived our life, died our death upon the cross, but death could not hold him, and now he reigns at your right hand. Therefore, Father, we celebrate this Passover of gladness, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Accept then through our risen Lord, Jesus Christ, our thanksgiving and praise. And unite us with all your people in every time and place that we may worship you forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, Heavenly Father, now and always. Amen. And we say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Some of you may have noticed that during that, one of my loggings kicked me out, and that's the one that's sharing the screen. So hopefully, hopefully we managed our prayers okay. But I think we're up and running again now for our final hymn, or we will be up and running for our final hymn when I allow myself to do it. Okay. So our final hymn, which is one of those Easter hymns that we can't do without at Easter, 
It is thine be the glory. So as we come to the end of our time of worship together, in a moment, I will invite everyone to unmute. But let us come first in our final prayer. Loving God, who through the risen Lord Jesus Christ promises to meet us on the way. We pray that in the coming days you would meet us through word. You would meet us through people. You would meet us through the moments of our lives, that as we walk with you, so we would become more confident in our acclamation that Christ is alive. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And I invite you to unmute yourself, if you will. And we will greet each other in the words of the grace. So may the grace, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and the love, and the love of, of God and the fellowship, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us, with us all evermore. evermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.